Investors and world leaders are seeking a new clean energy frontier and the African continent could become a goldmine for renewable energy due to the abundance of solar and wind energy. But the roadblocks to clean energy are amplified throughout the continent due to financial constraints and inadequate infrastructure. Let's take a look. There are a number of projects in the pipeline all geared at leapfrogging Africa's economy and energy infrastructure is taking centre stage. Modest starts in renewable energy have already begun across the continent. Wind power projects including Kenya's 0.3 gigawatt late Turkana project and 0.3 gigawatt of capacity under construction in Morocco development. However, our energy sources such as wind turbines overhyped. This turbine has zero impact on the environment at all and on no climate change, it doesn't kill fish, it doesn't disturb fauna and flora, it, it's just totally, totally harmless and it's really very easy to install. It's literally, you put it in the water, let it float on the, on the river, plug it in and the lights go on. Although alternative energy is a welcome concept, there are criticisms around energy sources such as nuclear power. We have abundant resources, renewable energy resources, and we don't need nuclear energy. Um, in Africa, I don't think it's feasible to think of nuclear power plants all over the African continent. The infrastructure is just not there. I also think it's better to generate power where you need it, like distributed energy. You have small grids that are connected to the big grid, but they're independent. With a nuclear power plant, you have to have hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of power lines going all over the place. Extremely expensive infrastructure. And I don't know that it's all that safe. But nuclear physicist Dr. Calvin Kim is not convinced that energy sources such as solar, wind and hydro are sustainable and reliable enough to power Africa's growth. I must emphasize I'm not opposed to solar and wind where solar and wind are genuinely economically viable, which usually means smaller standalone units far away from the main electricity supply. But it's wrong and if anything immoral to tell people that you can run a country on solar power and wind power when you only get wind when the wind blows and you only get solar power when the sun shines. Given past projects such as the South African 9.2 billion rand pebble bed modular reactor project that was abandoned in 2010 has raised questions around whether Africa has the funding, adequate security and regulatory framework in place to embark on such an endeavour. What's very important with nuclear is to have a good regulatory environment. Any country wanting to go into nuclear must abide by the requirements of the International Atomic Energy Agency. The country needs to have a, a national nuclear regulator to ensure that the whole operation of a nuclear plant is done according to international standards. Although the debates continue regarding which energy source will best serve Africa's advancement, it is reassuring to know that African leaders are doing their due diligence and are not just taking a shot in the dark. Dumisha Mahayele, Johannesburg. Joining me in studio to discuss alternative energy is Kadri Nasipi, CEO of South African National Energy Development Institute, Sanedi, and Thomas Garner, CEO of Synergy, and uh, Silas Zumu, he's the CEO of Suzlon Wind Energy South Africa. Before we go any further, gentlemen, can we just get one thing out of the way? In terms of the base load, aren't we always going to have to rely on coal? Because neither wind nor solar are going to be able to provide the base load. Kadri, let's get your thoughts. Thanks, Bowman. I think, first of all, we have to understand that we do have a rather extensive supply of coal left in the country and of course the coal mining industry and power generation sector relies exclusively on that for job creation in the country so we do have a limitation in the sense that we have to secure long-term job creation for the country there are other options as well the shale gas issue which has raised its head of course in the Karoo is one that also how can we forget the fracking issue absolutely mm -hmm. uh, but it raises the interesting question of how sustainable can we be with gas given that there's of course the environmental constraints that go with it but renewable energy has got a significant role to play in that regard because it's an emerging technology base in which to localize content that's the one thing that we don't have is a manufacturing capacity and there are companies that are willing to invest in this country to bring renewable energies and create jobs at the same time Silas, is it fair to put first world demands on third world people? And I asked my guests in the first half the same question. I think by the megawatt consumption that South Africa is consuming, 
or Africa is to consume. You know, we are a first world country. The, the demand determines that we are a first world country. Yes, the currencies may differ, but the, wherever you need to get an economy running positively in, in, in a sustainable manner, you need electricity there first. So it, it, you can't, you know, on electricity, it's either first or second or third world. We need it to, to, to ensure that we can then get our economy running. And, 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 and everybody has been saying we need an energy mix. You know, we should not say only coal or only nuclear or only wind. It's an energy mix. We already have enough on the coal side. Uh, and what we're saying is uh, due to climate change, which is a reality, we also need to uh, start uh, bringing in uh, renewable energy into, into the mix. What is the ideal mix? This must have been debated amongst the experts. Ronan, uh, from my view, I think the ideal mix is, is a mix where, uh, where there's, a, there's a good base load supplied by that type of technology, which is normally coal uh, or nuclear, and it can be a combination of that. Uh, then also large hydro, and then uh, made, made up uh, also then of renewables, wind, solar, uh, there's, there's various other technologies, biomass, biogas. Um, gas as well uh, is, in a, is available in Africa. So uh, the mix for me is a mix where you need to look at what's economically viable for the, for the continent and for the, and for the region. And then also at your, uh, at your grid emission factor. And currently the grid emission factor in the, in the southern African region is probably around one uh, ton of CO2 per megawatt hour. And I think we should target uh, anywhere between 0.3 and 0.7 uh, tons of CO2 per megawatt hour. Kadri, do you agree mm. with that mix as put forward by Thomas? Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously, we have to find a space for gas. Uh, you know, I'm going to come back to the shale mm. gas because I think it's something that has to be looked at in the future very seriously. But absolutely, there's got to be room for coal. Uh, currently, we're looking at carbon capture and sequestration as being the way to actually utilize coal in the future because that's got to be the issue. How do we capture and store? carbon dioxide underground if we are going to use coal in the future. That's got to be addressed. The nuclear issue on storage uh, of, of, of spent waste, that's got to be sorted out as well. But certainly on the renewable side, to come in uh, from a load following perspective, making sure that we can harness renewable energy as and when it becomes available. So I'd have to agree. I'd have to agree with that uh, energy mix. In terms of coal, are we somewhat schizophrenic about coal? I think uh, we, we actually don't understand uh, the advantages of coal uh, completely. I mean, coal is a cheap, abundant resource in South Africa and Botswana, for instance, many other African countries, and we should use that. But we should be responsible in the way we use it. Um, and in any technology that you put on from wind to coal, there's an environmental impact, and we need to manage that. What about nuclear after the Japanese Fiori? Is that not the dirtiest of all words when it comes to energy at the moment? Look, uh, if, if you look at the probabilities of what could be happening with Japan being the second disaster on nuclear uh, and comparing it to the number of years when nuclear was started, nuclear uh, stations were started, really you can ignore the number. Okay? The, the big factor is the fear it brings, the life-threatening fears that it has brought has what brought the attention of uh, the world now rethinking is nuclear the best. But you know, we should also analyze the design of what happened in, 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 in Japan. If you look at uh, uh, their design of that station, there's things that they could have done better. And this is where the experts should be coming in to say, for us not to repeat the Japanese experience, how are we going to design we should, uh, our, mm. our, our South African uh, uh, stations? We obviously look at mm. nuclear as part of South Africa's future, strongly mm. into 2012. It's in the plans going sure. forward. Is there a health risk in terms of uh, the Penandebe plant recently no. and incidents there? Well, we've been operating those type of reactors for the past, what, going on 30 years at least. And so we've got quite a good history of being able to manage uh, both at Pelindaba as well as at the Kuburg nuclear power station. So I think we've actually set up quite a thriving industry around radioactive isotopes and the management thereof. So yeah, from a spent fuel perspective, we probably need to manage that far more effectively. But I think on the whole, the newer generation of nuclear plants offers so much more in terms of safety. And obviously, if the, you look at the Fukushima Daiichi reactor as an example, you can't locate a nuclear reactor in one of the most seismically active areas in the world and not expect to have some kind of fallout, literally in this case. So there's got to be that type of consideration built into the design factor.
And but now the Germans are giving up mm. the nuclear path and they want it out of the way by 2020. Shouldn't we be following that example? Well, in the case of uh, supply constraints in terms of the, their own uh, source of renewable energy, they can obviously rely on the French to provide them with nuclear energy from across the border. So they have that luxury. We don't have that luxury. Well, we don't want to get into the German, the Germany-France <laughs> debate right exactly. now. We'll so leave that to the economists. But I, I agree. But I mean, yes, in an ideal world, yes, you'd want to move away to a technology that offers so much less in the way of, of security risk. However, at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, in, and this is in response to the earlier point about emission factors, if you want to move closer and closer to a lower emission factor, you have to consider then the fact that nuclear offers as an interim solution a far better proposition than what we have on the table right now. And Silas, there are experts out there who say that you need a farm as big as the entire Western Cape in either the solar space or the wind space to power the whole of South Africa. Is that viable? Where is all this land going to come from? The land has been there and it's not been utilized for any other thing, not even on agriculture. But uh, what we should be looking at is the advantages that these uh, uh, wind farms, these solar farms are going to bring to the communities where not a single person for years has ever thought the Eastern Cape, the Northern Cape would have a stimulating economy like it does. I wish I was born from there because uh, I think these are going to change the, the social economic the challenges that those people are going through. You cannot continue having people from those areas graduating and having to come look for work in Johannesburg where they become tenants for life. This is going to change the things where we're going to create the jobs where those people are and especially the Eastern Cape. You know, the Eastern Cape, I don't think in any map or even five years ago we had thought mm. something like this is going to happen to them. And I don't think the people in the Eastern Cape are aware of the good that these are bringing to them. How are we going to make coal commercially viable? Right now it's too expensive for an emerging market, for a developing environment. We know what's happening purely on the electricity rates in South Africa. And uh, of course there's going to be a huge problem for, for power as it uh, pervades the African continent. I think uh, if you look at coal-fired power, that is relatively cheap. Um, it's, w it's one of the cheaper solutions. But I think competition uh, in a market actually drives prices down. And we've seen it, uh, if you look at... So you mean it's all in the monopoly right now? I think it's all in the monopoly. And, and, and you can see that, that some of the, um, the wind power projects that were put in, in the window two of, of the Renewable Energy Independent Programme those wind tariffs actually lower than the coal-fired tariffs of, of a Madupi and a Kusile would be in the longer run.